mostly ready and running, no? Warming up in the, in the Congress, just mostly in the middle, no? We have these days, no? A day of talking about today about refugees, a movement of, of peoples. Uh, but f the first thing that we want to do is, is to introduce our three speakers, no? This morning, um, that we will join us, no? In, in this morning. Uh, first of all, Father Fabio Bayo is the Under Secretary of the Migrants and Refugees Section of the Dicastery for promoting integral human development since January, I think, 2017. No? Welcome, Father Bayo. Also, here on my right is uh, Michael Scherf, a good friend, Jesuit. He's from Germany. And he works uh, since January, well, last year, but it would be it was a, a long period also, no? Connected with GRS, and now he is the Deputy International Director of the Jesuit Refugee Service in Rome. And uh, last but definitely not least, Amaya Valcarcel, a Spanish refugee lawyer. Um, she joined the International Office of the Jesuit Refugee Service uh, in, already in 1908. Um, and she still works there as an advocacy officer. And if you want to know more about our speakers, of course, this is the place to go and look for them. And yes, of course, Alberto, we should also introduce ourselves. So <laughs> me, I'm, <laughs> I'm Claudia Bonamini. I'm the policy and advocacy coordinator at GRS Europe. And uh, today, to, together with Alberto Ares, our director at GRS Europe, we will be moderating this panel. Thank you, Claudia. Why is this panel important no, in our Congress in, in Loyola? We don't want to go to the origins, but uh, it's just to quote like, uh, no, something that came to me last days. No? They said, like many birds, but unlikely most other animals, humans are a mi migratory space. Indeed, migration is an all as humanity itself. Human migration is rooted in a specific historical conditions that define a particular social and economic context. Human migration and our mixed societies invite us to open roads on which to walk together in the richness of diversity, was saying Pope Francis. We are bearing witness to a historical crossroad where mig migratory flows and humanitarian emergencies are raising questions about our way of life, how we understand international relations, and how we manage diversity in our societies, and how we respond to the traumatic situation of the families that knock on our doors and cross borders. These days, there are about 763 million people on the move within their own countries, so they migrate inside their own countries, and uh, about 281 million international migrants, so people that cross the borders of the countries. Um, if these people were living in the same country, that would be equivalent to the fifth most populous country in the world. So that just to give you an idea, there is a lot of people on the move. Um, over 84 million of the people crossing their borders, the, the borders of their countries, they are, uh, they are forced to flee. So they, they are refugees, they are forced to leave their homes due to armed conflict, general vi generalized violence, but also natural disasters, uh, persecution. And out of these migrants, yeah, almost 26 million are refugees. Well, these are, this is because there are international definitions of what a refugee is, and so not everybody was forced to flee. In, in the case, for example, of people fleeing natural disasters, internationally, legally speaking, they are not considered refugees although we consider still them <laughs> refugees. Um, sadly, in the Mediterranean Sea, we have seen, you know, when it comes to Europe, we have seen uh, our sea becoming one of the greatest cemetery in the world. And of course, these days, we are faced with the crisis, uh, the war in, in Ukraine, and this is becoming the fastest growing humanitarian crisis, probably since World War II, uh, with more than well, with, with about four million refugees already uh, in a month. GRS? GRS has been following with concern the developments in Ukraine, even before the starts of the Russian military offensive. 
while we hope that they, they will soon be able to return safely, GRS and the Society of Jesus are mobilizing resources worldwide to provide immediate support in Ukraine and in neighboring countries. The Jesuit Refugee Service is currently coordinating the response for the reception and accompaniment of the refugees' population hand in hand with Savior Network. The Society of Jesus has committed strongly to promoting justice for migrants and refugees. Um, Father Pedro Arupe founded JRS in, in 1980, and in the last 40 years, um, the Jesuits feel that migrants and refugee mission is a grace and responsibility for us all. Also, in the last general congregations of the Society of Jesus, um, it was reaffirmed that providing services to migrant refugees and the internally displaced and victims of traffic is one of the apostolic preferences of the society. In the, face, uh, in the face of attitudes hostile to these displaced persons, our faith invites the society to promote everywhere a more generous culture of hospitality. This love of the society for the poor and the sclerosis expressed in deeds more than words has been more recently confirmed by the process of discernment that led to the promulgation of the universal apostolic preferences among which is our commitment to care for the migrants, displaced persons, refugees, and victims of wars and human trafficking. The Society has accepted as a mission of the Church through the Holy Father to continue to help create conditions of hospitality to accompany all these people in their process of integration into society and to promote the defense of their rights. In uh, this challenging time, the Society of Jesus, as well as all of us working at JRS, have been freshly inspired in our mission to accompany, serve, and advocate with and for migrants and refugees by the prophetic leadership of Pope Francis, who has called on the international community to have a shared response to refugees and migrants that can, ar be, can be articulated in four verbs. These are very important for us at JRS, um, to welcome, to protect, to promote, and to integrate. Pope Francis has insisted that what is needed is a fundamental conversion, a change in attitude, to overcome indifference and to counter fears. While years has been the focal point of the society's coordinated response to refugees, the Society of Jesus has developed an important network of specialized institutions working with migrants and displaced people. Jose Ignacio explained us on Monday about the migration network Jesuit Migrant Services and Jesuit Network for Migrants. Also, the Global Ignatian Advocacy Network uh, Migration, the, the, no? but also parishes, retreat centers, schools, social centers, and universities have been places of welcome, social action, and research for advocacy, often in partnership with the GRS and the Migration Network. Many Jesuit communities have also welcomed individ individual migrants, refugees, and families. Migrants are present in every region of the world, and the call to accompany and serve them is responsibility given to the entire body of the society, and it must resonate with the society and the services of the Society of Jesus everywhere we are present. This service to refugees and migrant, migrants requires a discernment that strives to be guided by the spirit, and an apostolic planning that makes effective use of human and all other available sources. It obliges us to deepen our vocation as collaborators in a mission that is only possible if our many efforts are combined. It also demands that we improve our ability to work through networks that makes better use of our resources, rendering us more effective in making the situation of refugees visible and in promoting actions to improve their integration in host countries. We are now moved to our panelists. Fabio Bayo will help us to understand the church strategy summarized by Pope Francis no, in four verbs to promote, to welcome, to protect, to promote, and to integrate. M Michael will invite us to dip in some GRS roots and frames such as reconciliation, education. And Amaya 
will help us to focus on some elements of the first two interventions also as well, offering some ideas and opportunities for joint actions. So welcome again, and uh, we give you the floor to Fabio Vallo. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm very pleased. I thank you, the organizers, and the moderator for the wonderful and inspiring introduction. Um, mm, I would like to talk about forced migrants and vulnerable people and the move and the response of the church. The Catholic Church has always cared for forced migrants, extending a, a special pastoral care for them. Such a commitment has intensified in the last 70 years, thanks in part to a new general sensitivity that stems from the rec recognition of refugees as people entitled to international protection. In this contribution, I would like to uh, present a summary of the teaching of the Catholic Church on refugees from Pius XII to Benedict XVI. Subsequ subsequently, I will focus on reflection and action during the pontificate of Pope Francis and conclude with a few suggestions and recommendations from Catholic actors. I will skip all the long list of documents of the church, about three pages, and I go directly to a summary of the documents, at least the one up to Pope Francis. The most recent documents on, of the Universal Magisterium underline that in the third millennium, the unfavorable conditions generating forced migration have increased. The contemporary picture is more and more characterized by mixed flows where it is difficult to distinguish economic migrants from asylum seekers and refugees. The growing trend by which industrialized countries tend to constrain the recognition of refugee status has provided more clients to people smugglers and traffickers. The debate on asylum seekers and refugees is often used for political purposes, and it increases hostile attitudes within local population towards foreigners. The association of asylum and, and terrorism instilled by media reports contributes to spreading suspicion and xenophobia in receiving countries. As for the challenges, the same documents insist on the necessity of addressing the root causes of forced migration, war, hatred, revenge, exclusion, injustice, socioeconomic inequalities, and globalization with no rules. In the case of human trafficking, the vicious cycle of poverty, abuses, and exploitation should also be added to the list of causes. With respect to internal displacement, further causal factors are persecution, natural disaster, dangerous climate changes, and the lack of condition for a decent life. The magisterial documents remind the international community of their responsibilities, namely the prevention of conflicts through respectful uh, monitoring, formulation of political responses, aiming at fostering sustainable local development, and post-war social reconstruction through the promotion of a true reconciliation process, engaging the opposite parties, and providing long-term financial support. The second challenge is the violation of forced migrants' rights, and the first right to be disrespected, through, though not included in the UN Declaration, is a right not to migrate, which means that every human being has the right to live peacefully and decently in his or her own country. When the conditions for a peaceful and decent life are not assured, people have a right to migrate elsewhere. And when such movement is marked by coercion, official protection should be secured, even in the case of stateless people, IDPs, and victims of human trafficking. Other rights of migrants include the right of, of, a refugee, of, to, of a refugee family to stay together. This is often neglected, and the situation has worsened in the res recent years. Catholic teaching underlines that the right not to migrate translates into the duty of the countries of origin to generate the necessary condition to warranty equitable access to the common good for all citizens. The increase of mixed flows does not release states from their duty of offering protection to all people who reach their borders to seek asylum because of a reasonable fear of persecution. The principle of no refoulement should also be respected in the case of people rescued at sea. The magisterial documents direct all states to guarantee the forced migrants and their family members the same rights of citizens, or at least of a resident foreigner 
including the right to freedom of religion. They should also enact specific laws and programs aiming at protecting IDPs, stateless people, and human trafficking victims. The third challenge highlighted by the magisterial documents is the confinement of asylum seekers and stateless people in jails, detention camps, or transit areas in airports, where personal freedom is con considerably limited. The Universal Magisterium states that, considering the particular conditions of asylum seeker and the negative effects produced by confinement, detention is not the appropriate administrative measure. States should develop alternatives to detention, such as monitored community programs, control and information mechanisms, support groups and open houses for families with children. Unaccompanied minors and migrant children should never experience detention. Connected with the above, there is also the humanitarian challenge of the refugee camps. Millions of refugees are compelled to live permanently in temporary structures, which are often located together in the same geographical region, with leading to frequent internal tension and conflicts, and with limited economic resources. Sorry, Life conditioned refugee camps are often inadequate, leading to frequent internal tension and conflicts. The situation is even worse when funds and goods are not dispensed regularly and the most vulnerable people suffer the consequences. Sometimes international organizations and media are not allowed to enter the camps where they might witness and denounce the services and abuses. The magisterial documents remind our governments that refugee camps are meant to be a temporary response to the plight of forced displacement. The international community cannot accept them as a permanent solution. Valid alternatives should be offered to refugees and the members of their families in, in the so short term. Moreover, greater international solidarity should be shown to the developing countries which are responsible for the majority of the refugee camps. The fifth challenge is, a, uh, is voluntary repatriation, which is strongly promoted when the conditions for international protection decay. If not properly assisted, such re-migration might merely return refugees uh, to a miserable life in the countries of origin. Church teaching calls on the international community to re-examine voluntary repatriation programs. Personal safety and dignity and positive social and economic conditions should be guaranteed before proceeding to repatriation. It is essential to effect effectively link humanitarian relief and sustainable development assuring the restoration of infrastructure, health, education, agriculture, employment, and priority access to food. The phenomenon of human, urban refugees is the last challenge. Protecting refugees who, who without, with or without authorization, have left the camps to settle in urban areas is especially complicated since in, the, in most of the cases, there is no specific program for them the magisterial documents remind national and local governments of their responsibilities in upholding the protection and rights of all refugees and members of their families, assuring the registration of refugee children at birth to avoid statelessness, employment, um, uh, employment possibilities, access to education, and legal resident, residence. UNHCR might be of great help through the release of personal <laughs> documents stating their status. And now we go to Pope Francis. From 2013, in words and deeds, Pope Francis repeatedly shows his deep compassion for refugees. Witness his, um, witness his encounters with uh, asylum seekers and refugees in, on the island of La Pedusa and Lesbos, and his many appeals in favor of forced migrants. All the Holy Father's teaching on refugees have been collected by the Migrant and Refugee Section of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. They are available for reading and research in a dedicated space in our website. Given the time constraints, I will try to underline the main magisterial points concerning the pastoral care of refugees. According to the pastoral understanding of the Holy Father, they are free time frames. With, which, with the, the activities of a pastoral key of refugees should be set in. The first time frame includes a, a series of short-term actions designed to save the life of asylum seekers and refugees. 
The second time frame comprises medium term objectives and those activities intended to formulate asylum, asylum policies and programs that acknowledge the centrality of the human person and in its integral human development. The last time frame features long-term activities and expresses the Church's commitment to eradicate the underlying causes of forced migration. On two occasions, the Holy Father introduced a life jacket as a tangible sign of the activities that the Church is called to carry out in order to safeguard the lives of millions of asylum seekers and refugees. Such protection arises from a call for mutual responsibility, which is the responsibility of all. This generalized loss of direction is especially caused by the alarming spread of a throwaway culture. Those real threats have been repeatedly pointed out by Pope Francis since the beginning of his pontificate. In his apostolic exaltation Evangelii Gaudium, the Holy Father op openly condemns the economy of exclusion and inequality that kills people, an economy that considers the loss of two points of, on the stock exchange more tragic than the death by exposure of an elderly homeless person. An economy that justifies is a world where the powerful feed upon the powerless. In an encounter with a large group of ambassadors in January 2015, Pope Francis dis listed displaced people and refugees among the first victims of a culture that promotes slavery and waste and gave an example dear to his predecessor, explaining how the Holy Family of Nazareth directly experienced its effects. One of the obvious negative consequences of a throwaway culture is the globalization of indifference, one of the evils that gravely afflicts humankind in the third millennium. In Evangelii Gaudium, the Holy Father warned that such a culture shapes an economy of exclusion, which of, is often justified by warranted economic benefits for all. But Francis openly challenges the decision, affirming that those wielding economy power seems to be more interested in excluding rather than including a good portion of the world population from the benefits of the progress. Faced with the many challenges to the protection of life posed by the contemporary forced migration, Pope Francis urges the church and all men and women of goodwill to offer life jackets by which he means to engage a series of short-term actions aimed at saving and protecting as many lives as possible. The first life jacket is sincere and fervent prayer that works miracles and can conquer our disbelief. The second short-term action consists in reporting the violations and abuses of which many migrants and refugees are victims. The third short-term action is rescuing asylum seekers and refugees and protecting their dignity. In November 2014, the Holy Father addressed the European Parliament in Strasbourg and voiced the need for international coordination of the rescue operations and a more equitable distribution of rescue responsibilities. The Church's medium-term strategy has been admirably summarized by Pope Francis in the four verbs which have already been mentioned before, to welcome, to protect, to promote, and integrate. They stand for the four pillars of a coordinated and effective action in response to the challenges of a present-day forced migration, an action that the Church must develop in collaboration with all political and social stakeholders in order to bring about a forward-looking governance of migratory flows that will benefit everyone. With the first verb to welcome, Pope Francis wishes to, to highlight the need to prefer, prefer eternity to rejection, thus generously welcoming those who flee suffering and conflict. The Holy Father has repeatedly voiced the need to establish legal and safe migratory corridors with a view of to protecting asylum seekers and refugees from deceits and unprincipled and violent criminal organizations. He has also recommended that asylum seekers and refugees be accommodated in other ways and decent places, in dispersed rather than concentrated accommodations, in order to avoid large groupings of migrants who often end up exacerbating situations of vulnerability and distress in the receiving communities. The second verb to protect refers to the actions needed to protect the asylum seekers and refugees from the violence, abuse, and exploitation that 
they often fall victim to because of their extreme vulnerability. According to Pope Francis, such protection must rely on adequate national and international juridical tools. Special care is needed for the protection of refugee minors who should be granted regular access to primary and secondary school. For unaccompanied minors or those separated from their families, temporary guardianship or, or foster care schemes should be implemented. The, the verb to promote summarizes all the action that have the main as their main goal, the integral human development of asylum seekers and refugees, as well as that of the communities that wel welcome them. All the dimensions of human existence are to be deemed essential, work and professional activity, education, social relationships, religion and family life. And in relation to the letter, to the letter the Holy Father has repeatedly reasserted the importance of family term effects focuses on the underlying causes of forced migration and mis mismanagement of natural resources. Pope Francis points out that people forcibly displaced by climate crisis often do not enjoy any legal protection. Beyond the factors mentioned above, which can be described as circumstan circumstantial, there are some endeavors. Pope Francis' teaching in, is particularly rich in insights and that provide a complete picture of the action that must be put in place to definitely eradicate the underlying endemic and circumstantial causes of forced migration. I'm going to the action. Yeah. With the apostolic lecture, uh, Human Progress Progress and Progression, and Pope Francis established the Dicastery for promoting integral human development. Within the Dicastery of the Holy Father wanted a section dealing specifically with matters regarding refugees and migrants, and he placed it temporarily under his personal direction. The migrant and refugee section is tasked to give practical expression to a fundamental aspect of the Church's mission, to accompany God's people in all their joys and hopes, griefs and anxieties, especially of those who are poor or in any way afflicted. The migrant and refugee section started its activity on January the 1st, 2017. The United Nations process to produce two global compacts, one on safe, orderly, and regular migration, and the other on refugees, represented a unique opportunity for the Holy See and the migrant and, re and refugee section to be engaged. And this is why we decided to contribute actively to the two processes. To support this contribution, our section, consulting with various bishop conferences and Catholic NGOs working on the field, prepared a document titled 20 Action Points Towards the Global Compacts. The points are grouped under four headings, welcome, protect, promote, and integrate. And they have been approved by the Holy Father. They are grounded on the Church's best practices, responding to the needs of migrants and refugees at the grassroots level. In September 2017, the Holy See presented these points as a, a position paper to the Secretary of the United Nations. Since throwing up the 20 action point, the Migrant Refugee Section has proactively engaged with the Secretary of State and Permanent Mission in New, in New York, Geneva, and Vienna, contributing to the presentation of this input to a representative of member states in consultation, negotiation, sites, events, and direct meetings. We also work a lot with the Bishop Conferences and with other Catholic NGOs around the world in order to promote this action point. It's very interesting because in 2018, the two global councils were adopted in two different sections of the United Nations, and most of the countries were part of this general adoption of a, of a, uh, of a GC, uh, we, we call it Global Compacts. We are just... Uh, very happy to see that uh, the structure of the Global Compact of Migrants is reflecting a lot of the points that you raised. On the uh, about the, uh, concerning the Global Compact on Refugees, uh, it presented the international community with the opportunity to shift from a reactive approach to a more proactive one, which will be more predictable and harmonized and thus more effective. As in a more multilateral process, the outcome of, of this consultation is a document which reflects compromises a realistic balance of interest and aspiration of hosting countries, of donors and other stakeholders, and, and donors and other stakeholders. In its first three years of existence, the, the section has assisted several local churches in the development and implementation of program addressing asylum seekers and refugees. The assistance offered by the migrant and refugee section is divided into four main areas. 
First is collecting information. The second is reflecting and producing reflection um, uh, booklets about uh, pastoral orientation of the different fields. The third is about helping local churches to develop their pastoral programs. And the fourth is helping local church to act. And whenever the church is very weak, also entering effectively into the action through the services of many uh, NGOs. To better understand the, uh, the scope of the assistance offered by the Migrant Relief Section, I would like to introduce one concrete example. Since 2017, the Migrant Relief Section has assisted 10 Bishop Park conferences in South America to respond to Pope Francis' call to welcome, pro protect, promote, and integrate migrants and refugees, particularly with respect to the massive migration from Venezuela. Through coordinated action, uh, the, the Bishop conferences assisted by the section uh, uh, they develop holistic plans and they set out a wide range of activities and services that addresses them. Examples of such activities are center and shelter for vulnerable migrants, assistance in housing, job seeking and social inclusion, facilitation of access and education and health services, advoc advocacy and legal assistance, professional training of pastoral agents, awareness campaign and sensitization of local communities. In uh, the last count was about April 2019, Puente de Solidaridad, the project assisted more than 122,000 Venezuelans and other people, and more than 400 local agents were trained. I would like just go to, uh, to the final points, since we have time constraints, and uh, with some suggestions and recommendations. The complexity of the contemporary forced migration scenario calls for a comprehensive and coordinated pastoral response to the challenges posed by asylum seekers and refugees today. Such a response should consider three different areas of action, advocacy, assistance, and mission. The Catholic Church is called to engage in a resolute exercise of advocacy aimed at improving legislation, policies, and programs, addressing asylum seekers and refugees to bring about greater protection and promotion of all people involved. This advocacy work, grounded in the social teaching of the Catholic Church, should also seek the enhancement of a legal pathway and quotas for refugees. Second, in continuity with the, her long-standing charitable tradition, the Catholic Church is called to cater to the basic needs of asylum seekers and refugees, offering well-chosen assistance and services to achieve their integral human development. Most of the time, it will be enough to include them in the services that the Catholic Church, the Catholic communities and centers are already offering to disadvantaged brothers and sisters. Special services to be developed at ad hoc can take insp inspiration from the countless best practices of a, of a Catholic Church all over the world, and we have collected many of them. From a missionary perspective, the presence of asylum seekers and refugees of other religions can be seen as a new frontier of formation, a privileged opportunity to proclaim Jesus Christ and the gospel message at home, to bear concrete witness to the Christian faith in a spirit of charity and profound esteem for other religious communities. Thank you. Challenges, opportunities, life jackets, pillar causes, actions, global compacts, best practices, and these three proposals, no, in actions, no, advocacy, assistance, and a mission. Uh, thanks, Father Fabio Bayo, for your comprehensive uh, approach that helped us to build a holistic view of the reality of migrants and refugees around the world. And now we are giving the floor to Michael Shelf to continue with the presentation. I don't know if the communication team can, can go through the presentation also. Uh, we need to stick. Okay. This one, no?
there is a new experience. A war broke out in Europe in a way that most of us felt and hoped this would never be possible again. And now it's us who are the neighboring countries where people flee first. The message that this, a message that this aggression, that the aggressors convey, is really very clear. You have no right to live. If you are not at the disposal of my will, if you are not the subject of my interests, your life doesn't count. You have no life of your own. This is the message. Nadezhda Sukhorokova from Mariupol, she gave an eyewitness account in one of the German newspapers last week, Die Zeit, and I think it's worth listening to her. Do you know how much I dread being separated from someone, even if just for a few minutes? I tell myself again and again that I'm no longer in this hell, Mariupol, and still hear the clatter of the airplanes. I wince at each noise and draw in my head. I'm afraid when someone leaves. There, in that hell, not everyone came back who left. The following day, when everything shrieked and rattled as, as if someone cut a giant glass with a hexa, a plane passed by very close, blustering. The children and the adults lay down in the basement on a long sofa, their heads covered with cushions. And I, on top of it, closed my eyes really hard. Until now, I don't understand why. Probably, I thought, my cushion could save me from the bombs. Then 13-year-old Sasha came running and shouted, it's me, Sasha, our house just got hit, it's finished. We asked, where is your mom? Did everyone survive? And he responded, yes, everyone. But dad got trapped and mom is trying to dig him out. It then turned out that his dad got trapped forever. A calm and good-natured man, he lay there with a broken skull and an unnaturally twisted leg in his own apartment on the ninth floor. It was impossible to bury him or even take him out. There, in Mariupol, many things were unimportant. We ate all from the same plate in order not to waste water rinsing the plates. Several of us slept together on the same mattress because it was warmer that way, and we didn't take our caps off. We simply forgot that something like a shop exists, that you can watch TV, communicate in social media, take a shower or sleep in a real bed. It was announced today that less than 40,000 persons were able to leave the city. There are still 100,000 people who remain in hell, with every new day, it gets more difficult for them to survive. Please help them. Tell the truth about my city. Aggressors, that's the experience, create uninhabitable wastelands to erase life. And while the shocking images from Ukraine are new for us, we have recently been confronted with similar, similar realities in other places. Aleppo in Syria shares the fate of Mariupol and the so-called military experts that caused the total destruction of, of Aleppo have been called to join Ukraine. In Myanmar, people whose villages have been destroyed three or four times already continue to be bombed by the military regime explicitly in the churches and convents where they sought refuge. They are chased from refuge to refuge. This new experience overshadows the, experience, the older experiences of violence and aggression in Europe, the politics of exclusion, of making unwanted refugees invisible by means of our laws, regulations, and policies. I vividly remember a visit uh, to the JRS UK Day Center some uh, years ago uh, where I met an Afghan man somewhere in his 30s who came to the UK more than 10 years previously. His asylum claim was quickly rejected and he received the order to leave the territory of the UK. The man had lost all his family members in Afghanistan and the family's property had been confiscated. For 10 years already he has been uh, sleeping rough on the bridges and in the parks. In the morning, he goes to one NGO for homeless people in order to take a shower. 
Then he goes to another NGO in order to get his breakfast. And once a week he came to the JRS UK Day Center to clear his mind, as he said. His only relationship with the British state at this stage was a pill that he got once a week for a psychiatric condition that he developed because the way he had to live. The state simply wanted to return him and provide no assistance whatsoever. Our work is to be with this man during a few hours, to sit with him, to be available, in silence if he wishes, or talking, to let him know that he's welcome. This is a relationship which is fundamentally different from uh, what, ex what he experiences with almost everyone else. A relationship that helps him, as he says, clear his mind since he is addressed as a human person. We have witnessed this type of violence that denies forcibly displaced persons the right to live through detention, destitution, and often at our borders. For each person, it is no less brutal than the violence of Mariupol, just more invisible. We isolate people from our societies, we break relationships and often break people. There is a clear need for reconciliation from our side. So what can we do with this aggression that negates the right to live? That for me was one of the fundamental questions when working with JRS. Let me try a personal answer. Accompanying refugees and working with them has been for me a story of conversion. And everything in this story starts with being with the refugees, staying with them where they are. Being with means an encounter. And it's an open encounter in which I meet another person who is not the object of my will or my desires. Very often for me it includes an experience of powerlessness, of loss of control, of abandoning my own reference point in order to enter into this relationship, all of which are counter-cultural experiences in today's world. This equals the desire of being with Jesus. Once I let go of my preconceptions, my perceived needs, I am given back to myself in a different way. Being with refugees teaches me about how I myself want to live a better life and about the society I really want to live in. In religious terms, this is a sacramental and evangelizing experience that comes directly with the encounter and needs no further mediation. In Ignatian terms, it is finding God in all things, and I think it is an experience that is open to any person of goodwill. Then there is the aspect of community. Real encounters often result in a life-giving experience, a life-giving experience that I want to share with others. We have discovered together a little more who we are really meant to be as far as we exist with God. We can offer destitute asylum seekers not only something to eat, but a place where they can belong to. We can send asylum seekers who live in the street not only to an emergency shelter, but welcome them in our homes for a while. We can go back to detention again and again to show our belief that a different future is possible. It is a very different conception of community compared to a group of persons that are simply uh, recipients of my services or objects of my policy making, however well-intentioned that might be. There is also an aspect which concerns the staff members and the volunteers. We make this experience as a group. We help each other to understand it, to find a language for it, to stay in this sacramental dynamic. There is a growing and deep knowledge of God's presence in our own broken lives. We have witnessed so many of these moments when being with refugees and with policymakers, and more than once these moments led us to recognize our own brokenness as friends 
we do know each about each other in this respect. The experience has made us more humane and therefore more open to the divine, to a reality that does not depend on our own limitations. Then there is the experience of hope. This does not simply speak about a better world in a near or distant future. In our brokenness, it is about seeing what God has meant us to be. And this involves finally a complete change of perspective. It comes as a gift from refugees that I often experienced as a real relief. Because it sets free the, fulfill the longing for fulfillment. And finally, there is the desire for surrender, which can only be a surrender to love. We experience that we can let go of ourselves and are given back to us in a different way, in a new way. This brings peace. God offers himself in the fulfillment of the resurrection that is a promise which we can live already now. And we know that we can never achieve this ourselves. The faith that originates from the encounter such, in such ways finds its way back into the everyday existential and sometimes a very technical struggle for God's fulfillment. Ultimately, this journey is a journey of love. And for me, Teres has opened, opened up the encounters and ways to insert myself into this journey and into God's love. So in my view, the answer of JRS to this brutal violence and aggression that we experience these days in so many places, the answer to the incredible scope of the destruction and negation of life can only start with our desire to be with people who are the victims of this aggression, to offer accompaniment. And in this situation, to find our way to participate in God's love for everything that he or she created, to search for his life together from the perspective of those who suffer. And uh, I think we have seen such um, signs of love in a very practical way also in the recent crisis. I'm really proud of the way Jairus responded in the past months to the unprecedented challenges that the war in Ukraine presents, that the aggression in Myanmar presented. And I would like to thank uh, at this moment everybody wholeheartedly who is giving himself and herself to this new mission. In the second part of my intervention, I would briefly like to um, address four areas, reconciliation, mission and identity, education and advocacy. These are challenges and possibilities that I believe emerge from the place where we are now. On the one hand, they are characteristics for the, for the response that JRS can provide. And on the other hand, at the same time, they are also open questions for the future. In the past years, we developed a conceptual framework for our approach to reconciliation. Uh, the main question there is, in the situations where we are present, how can we recreate right relationships among JRS teams, among refugees we serve, and between refugee and host communities? How can we recreate right relationships? Right relationships are the anchor for reconciliation in JRS. They are supported by four dimensions or principles. Accompany refugees on their journey towards reconciliation. Invite participation. Work for justice that restores and transforms relationships. And prioritize the value of shared humanity. This explicit approach is fairly new, a fairly new departure in JRS. We have experience in projects in Colombia, in Tigray, and elsewhere, mainly in standalone projects where reconciliation is the main focus. From this point, we can see several challenges for the next steps. How can we particularly work with our teams in situations where the teams themselves reflect the tensions already present in society, for example, in Tigray? 
how can we integrate the reconciliation approach with other areas of work in JRS, for example, the mental health area, the livelihoods area? How can we integrate the reconciliation framework right from the beginning of a project, when we start a presence in a, in a, in a particular place? It is an area of work that is closely linked to our mission more, I believe, than any of the technical areas. It is important in shaping our response in all continents where we are present, and not least, it is important for shaping our response to the war in Ukraine. The Sant'Egidio community today is known for its engagement in peace building. Could JRS be known in some years for its commitment to reconciliation in, its, in all its activities? I think that's an important question for us. The reflection on reconciliation brings me to a second area, JRS's mission and identity. Reconciliation is an individual act as much as forgiveness. Conversion is an individual process based on encounters that engage the person. Yet we are a group of people who make this experience together on based on the accompaniment of refugees, each one in his her own way, context, and with their own background. Since this experience is at the essence of what we do, where and how can we share it? Where do we have such spaces? How is this built into our reflection, into our evaluations and programming? How can it help maintain and refresh our mission to accompany Sarov and Advocate? I think in the past years we had um, several attempts to work on, on mission and identity in JRS. Most attempts were based were, were, were top down, and they were based on documents and linked to special occasions like retreats and trainings. While some of this is necessary, I think it is also limited. Is there another way to engage in this conversation in our local teams on how the encounters with forcibly displaced persons have changed me? and have changed the meaning I give to my life. And on how this changes the way we work together and the choices we make. The Ignatian tradition provides, I think, two important tools with the examine for an individual practice and spiritual conversation for a group that engages us in such processes. I think it's really important to find the right spaces for this type of discernment so that we are helped to renew our mission in today's context. And then the outcome can also be important, obviously, for decision-making. How can this be done with a bottom-up approach, starting with the teams? Over the past decades, JRS gained considerable experience in the areas of education and livelihoods, mental health and psychosocial support, and in some geographical areas, also in integration. In many ways, we have grown professionally from the times back when we assisted Vietnamese boat people in the Philippines with language courses and when we supported the first Sudanese teachers and parents in northern Uganda who started to give lessons under the trees. We discovered the utmost importance of girls' education and the inclusion of children who are hidden from the public eye by their own communities. We seek to move from assistential livelihood programs to training opportunities that are better adapted to the fluid context, the virtual opportunities, and that contribute to a basic income faster than an entire formal education. We have become aware that the role of MHPSS programs, that, uh, of the important role that MHPSS programs play as a bridge between an emergency situation uh, and a uh, face of reconstruction of one's own life. Tools such as psychological first aid are available for staff and refugees. Our approach to integration, I think, has uh, various origins that come together in the knowledge that integration starts on day one. Support for language training, accommodation, job search are classical tools. Refugees also taught us clearly that integration has a protection and human rights dimension. In a short study, women arriving in Malta were asked when they feel that their human rights are respected. And the answer was not when I get a house or something to eat. The answer was when I belong to a community again. Offering hospitality in the homes of families and communities has really been 
of inv invaluable practical help and also a strong sign of a public practice of virtue. I see these three areas as areas of excellence for JRS. This is where we should be able to make a significant contribution also in the respective professional field. Each of these areas started with the intention that Pedro Arupe had for the beginning of JRS, share with those in need the resources we have at our hands. We have developed many global networks, many partnerships in the meantime. We are inserted into the professional communities and should continue to ensure that we can offer innovative quality services. As global resources, they can be of great benefit also in new situations like today, Ukraine and Mozambique. I think we should ask ourselves, how can we best invest in these areas to further learn and to be of further service? The last challenge I would like to touch on is advocacy as an inter integral part of our mission and in particular global advocacy. Clearly all advocacy in JRS starts from the accompaniment, the selection of the issues and the representation of refugee voices. Many advocacy issues are local in nature because the protection needs can be best addressed locally. Many JRS regions have regional advocacy topics, issues that really play a role in a number of countries and that can be best addressed by joining forces in research and strategy through a joint project. We are strong at this level in Europe, in the MENA region and several others. At the global level, we have excellent links with the migrant and refugee section from the Vatican and we have a great opportunity with a JRS representative in Geneva, accredited with the UN. At the same time, there is a clear challenge. What we need to develop in 22, I believe, is a joint strategy for the global level. Which are the two to three issues arising from our accompaniment that we want to pursue with a mid-term perspective for fundamental change? For example, important issues concern the lack of protection for the internally displaced people in many locations, access to education beyond primary school, and for specific groups, and integration issues linked to livelihoods. We also need to, a capacity to advocate more strongly and in a more coordinated way for emergency situations. It is crucial to keep the violence exerted by the, by the Myanmar military regime on the international agenda, and to make persistently known how difficult or how almost impossible it is to run an education project with a significant human rights perspective in Afghanistan. And then there are the truly global issues, the global compacts that were mentioned already, that represent the only mechanism for a global conversation on protection today. To be effective, we need to have strong and consistent advocacy capacities in all the locations that are important for bringing about change, Brussels, Washington, Geneva, and Rome, and all those places that are central for a chosen issue. I think today we still have many gaps there, and I see this as a challenge, also a challenge to be truly faithful to all aspects of our mission to accompany, serve, and advocate. To conclude, that th these aspects which I've, which I've mentioned here are represented somehow in our agreed uh, strategic framework in JRS, the Global Strategic Framework, uh, I thought it's important to mention them, but obviously there are other questions that go beyond those that we can see already, challenges we face and also possibilities uh, that might emerge. And I won't discuss them, but just mention two of them. The first one is there are increasingly places where it is, where it is difficult for us uh, to work. Examples, Afghanistan, Mozambique, Myanmar. Humanitarian actors, they speak of shrinking space due to suppression, due to a very volatile security situation, or due to both. How can we be present there as an international NGO? I, we need to think of a new way of operating in such environments and still want to be faithful to our mission that has accompaniment at its core. Who could be our possible and maybe very small local partners. What does accompaniment look like in such conditions? 
In the 1990s, terrorists learned to develop a presence in the big refugee camps, mainly focusing on education. Some 10 to 15 years ago, terrorists developed meaningful ways for a presence in Muslim countries. How can we be present in today's new environments? The second point that I wanted to mention is the question, how can we become operational quickly in a structure where JRS depends on Jesuit provinces as their main sponsor? When we find ourselves in the midst of an emergency, like Ukraine, I think we really have improved a lot in terms of crisis management. This is also shown by the incredible and well-coordinated response together with the Jesuit provinces and the Xavier Network. In the midterm, we need a global or regional infrastructure to run these much larger projects, to ensure their quality and also to provide the necessary administration. This is a question currently in Latin America and obviously also in Europe. And if you look back uh, at the past in Europe, Europe has a tradition. Additional operational capacity was needed during and after the war in Yugoslavia and the solution was a separate region. It was needed in Morocco and Greece at the EU external border, and the solution was an operation from the regional office. And now again it's needed with the war in Ukraine, and we are going to look for a solution. When the pandemic hit and the first lockdown came in France, the community of Tessé felt that they were hit very hard because their very mission, welcoming large numbers of young people and praying with them, was no longer possible from one day to another. Hibernation, or worse, resignation, might have been an obvious and understandable response. Just wait no, until someday it will be over and the mission can be resumed. But it would have been a long period of isolation, and this is what they became aware of. Breaking the relationships that were at the basis of the commitment of the community. And after an initial period of frustration, the community decided to open their church and their houses for all those who might feel the same, lonely and isolated, and to invite them to simply stay throughout the lockdown with them, not just a week or two, uh, but maybe a, a couple of months or half a year. I wish all of us that we remain in touch with God's love for his creation. And I wish those who are connected with refugees and the forcibly displaced that we may continue to find meaningful ways to share their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, also for your personal uh, experience of conversion and also for your deep uh, approach no, on all these uh, no, questions around reconciliation, advocacy, mission, identity, education. Thank you so much. Um, now, Amaya will give you the floor after these two interventions also to thank you. No? Thank you very much, Alberto and Claudia, and uh, Michael and Father Fabio who reminded us of the three time frames that Pope Francis understands for the pastoral care of refugees. And as we have heard many times this morning, um, the strategy has been admirably summarized by Pope Francis in, in the four famous words, uh, to welcome, to protect, to promote, and to integrate. So these verbs have shaped one of the best documents that I feel the Migrants and Refugees section has drafted which uh, Father Fabio re referred to, the 20 points of, uh, of action for the Global Compact on Refugees and Migrants, which in turn sets a clear roadmap to all Catholic organizations, inclu including JRS, to address migration. So I will use these verbs to wrap up these two great interventions, offering some ideas uh, and opportunities for joint action. We are seeing that uh, whereas Western leaders continue to stoke fears and fabricate crises over a small number of refugee arrivals, the real crisis is a lack of solidarity and access to refugee protection globally. So regarding welcome, 
um, access to asylum, to safety, remains a major challenge, as both Michael and Father Fabio mentioned. I feel that concrete responses should still go in line of taking action to address the deaths and pullbacks at the Mediterranean Sea, but not only, also the Atlantic and other seas. Um, but the Mediterranean is really the most dangerous migratory route in the world. UNHCR reports in, that in 2021, uh, 2,000 migrants were dead or missing in the Mediterranean, with the death toll similarly rising along the Atlantic route to Spain. So we need to continue calling for the re-establishment of a dedicated search and rescue capacity in the Mediterranean and for the end of the criminalization of organizations supporting those in need. Interceptions and pullbacks to unsafe ports reached the peak last year, including to Libya, where you, we know very well that migrants are routinely detained and exposed to violence and abuse. In its diplomatic efforts with the Libyan authorities, we must continue calling the EU to prioritize the safe and swift release of all migrants from detention centers and establish and expand alternatives to detention. Another challenge to the welcome of refugees is access to a fair and full asylum procedure for people seeking international protection, no matter the circumstances and without undue restrictions. We regret states' growing reliance on the safe country concept and the, and the safe third country concept to deny asylum applications in so many parts of the world. The welcome of migrants and refugees cannot be fulfilled without humane and effective reception systems, which respect people's dignity, protect their mental health, and foster their inclusion into host societies. The closed controlled access centers recently inaugurated in the Greek islands amount to de facto detention, and unfortunately, they are replicating the Australian uh, system in Prismas Island and in other islands. So we are seeing not only a globalization of indifference, but a globalization of bad practices, really. So let us continue reminding states to reject such models and invest in community-based accommodation with a commitment to ending migration-related detention. And thank you, Megan, for sharing Joel's uh, story this morning and for all the work you do in JRS UK and also to Chandra Stali, present here for fostering the, the right and humane reception systems. Regarding protection, I, I think with, with all of you that refugees cannot be protected if they are not considered as such. Father Fabio referred to the teaching of the Catholic Church on refugees and a fundamental document for us in GRS is the 1992 document called Refugees, a Challenge to Solidarity. It is the first document on refugees that, you know, offer a clear definition of refugee as a de facto refugee. So besides the motivations presented in the 1951 uh, convention uh, regarding the, the causes of, of persecution, so um, race, religion, membership in a social or political group, the church widens up this definition to the victims of armed conflicts erroneous economic policy or natural disaster. So looking ahead of time already, we are talking of 1992. So how we consider refugees according to what definition or interpretation is fundamental since it can really exclude people to the margins of our societies, as Claudia mentioned, to destitution. The decision to trigger the temporary protection directive across the EU to refugees fleeing the war in Ukraine must serve as a lasting reminder of the values that Europe holds dear and of what it can accomplish when it acts jointly in a spirit of solidarity to uphold refugee protection. But states should display the same level of commitment and humanitarian leadership to other displacement situations and people seeking safety who have regrettably received a very different treatment as we know in the past. Other ongoing displacement situations and the fate of asylum seekers have not disappeared as a result of the crisis in Ukraine and must not be forgotten or under-resourced 
as a result. States not only increasingly fail to comply with asylum norms and obligations, but are doing so more openly and with apparent impunity. Multiple states have in various ways sought to externalize their protection responsibilities, keep asylum seekers out, and return people to danger by building walls, conducting violent pushbacks, or seeking to offshore asylum procedures. Other governments have made repeated efforts to effectively suspend the right to asylum, de facto or in national legislation, and failing to protect people arriving at the borders. In response to the Afghanistan emergency in 2021, European leaders stoked fears of possible arrivals of people in need of protection and predominantly focused on keeping refugees from Afghanistan in neighboring countries to Afghanistan. Together with other church partners, JRS continues to advocate for fair, predictable, and sustainable systems to share responsibility for people seeking protection, centered on relocations, and to expand safe and regular pathways to protection, including by increasing and fulfilling refugee resettlement pledges, or by implementing humanitarian corridors. The 1992 document also referred for the first time to the definition of internally displaced people. I quote, for humanitarian reasons, these displaced people should be considered as refugees in the same way as those formally recognized by the convention, because they are victims of the same type of violence. As Michael just said, uh, protection and assistance of IDPs is a major challenge. Today we can think of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Venezuela, South Sudan, Colombia, Ukraine, as some of the main countries where IDPs not only are displaced but are constantly displaced. Protracted the IDP situations are ever more challenging. They can provoke severe mental health consequences as we, see, as we have seen recently in Iraq, where we accompany the Yazidi survivors. And in the last weeks, seven of them have committed suicide, unfortunately. Michael also referred to two types of violence. One is about making people invisible, the other more evident by aggression. But an invisible aggression today is the conflict of, in Myanmar, where lack of international attention and lack of access to populations in need is causing a humanitarian disaster. This is an example where the Myanmar Jesuit mission, the Migrants and Refugees Section, JRS, are regularly alerting jointly on the need to protect and assist the forgotten IDPs. We do so discreetly because of the security implications this can have in our teams and in the Jesuits present there. I spoke to Mark, uh, the Jesuit superior, um, and on behalf of him, I want to thank those Jesuit missions present here for supporting the people uh, of Myanmar. Regarding promotion, um, it is about a determined effort to ensure that all migrants and refugees are empowered to achieve their potential as human beings. Michael referred to reconciliation and education as key responses by JRS. We understand education not only as a means of protection from abuse, from recruitment, but also more and more linked to livelihood opportunities which is a concrete way to translate the promotion of refugees into a life-giving experience. And now the Dicastery for the Service of Integral Human Development has work for all uh, as a main focus. Integration concerns the opportunities for intercultural enrichment brought about by the presence of migrants and refugees, not only an assimilation that leads migrants to suppress or to forget their own cultural identity, but contact with others leads to discovering their secret. The Holy Father's new message for 2022 is precisely about building the future together with migrants and refugees. The word with calls for the meaningful involvement of refugees in the life of our communities and also in policy making. We jointly, with many of you here, invest in refugees integration and inclusion, in particular those most vulnerable, women, children, the elderly. But we have also many good news. 
many reasons and sources of consolation. We know that the complexity and scope of our world can easily lead us to hopelessness and even paralysis, but what are the sources of inspiration? The first, for me, is really the hope we, we find in the refugees themselves, in the people we serve. They are inspiring, they are constantly an inspiration for, for us. I also think that the mission that Father Arupe imagined for Jerez continues to shape and inspire us and to, to also um, shape our way of proceeding. So to go where there is a greater need, where others are not present, to be a switchboard, creating partnerships and facilitating others to engage in refugee work, to keep a light structure in order to respond swiftly, to pray constantly. The vision of Pope Francis for our work with refugees and migrants, summarized beautifully in Fratelli Tutti, is another source of consolation and a theological pillar. His vision is also one about serving the local churches, facilitating the service and, and, and to refugees. The Migrants and Refugees section does precisely this, but Fabio explained it very well, acting as a connector of different Catholic partners. For example, a Jesuit from Angola, which many of you know, Father Avelino Chico, is um, one of the regional coordinators for Africa in the section, and he's actually fostering partnerships in the different countries he's serving. In terms of tools, I think one of the best contributions of the migrants and refugee sections are the many high quality documents which translate into action and good practices, uh, Fratelli Tutti. In the format of pastoral orientations on IDPs, on climate displaced persons, or on human trafficking, we have also developed thematic notes, such as on regularizations on, on, of migrants, which is such an important issue here in Spain right now. And all this work is done through a very humble and efficient listening exercise of all Catholic actors, so Sant'Egidio, Franciscans, JRS, and others and bishop conferences. I think this is, for me, uh, a source of consolation to see the beauty of the church worldwide serving refugees and migrants and listening to them. So I want to call your attention to all these great resources. You can use them and contextualize them in each of your cultural settings. You have them in the resource uh, area of the website of the Migrants and Refugees section. In a world which uses so many euphemisms, having a clear mission, vision, and, and a roadmap is a treasure. So we thank Pope Francis and the Migrants and Refugees section for setting the way forward. We have many opportunities to inspire the new generations through Jesuit schools and universities. Let them become switchboards of inspiration for future generations, inspiring women and men for others, as Father Arupe said. Young people are for me another source of consolation. I have the privilege to spend my summer in Teze every year. I share my work with refugees, with young people, and I have the, the certainty that they understand very well, I think even better than, than us uh, adults, the invitation of Pope Francis' vision to create a wider we. They have good practices, they have um, a more openness to, to intercultural uh, way of living. No? And finally, I believe the real good news comes from a very deep experience of absolute poverty and also richness, which is explained beautifully by Jesus in the parable of the vine and the branches in John 15. So overwhelmed by our task of promoting, welcoming, promo uh, protecting refugees and migrants, I think Jesus asks us to simplify. The real conversion is about remaining in him. It is not about a conversion to something, but to someone. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This may be our most fundamental mission, to remain in Christ. And the rest can flow. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Amaya, for this wonderful speech around the four pillars and all this connection that you've been doing you know, 
with all this background from GRS and from this connection also with the migrants and refugee section. Thank you so much. Uh, well, many things going on this 